Welcome to In Via, the podcast where we're navigating the pilgrimage of life. We are all in via, on the way, and we are learning a lot as we go. I'm your host, Joan Watson. Join me as we listen to stories, discover travel tips, and learn more about our Catholic faith. Along the way, we'll see that if God seeks to meet us in Jerusalem, Rome, or Santiago, he also wants to encounter you right there in your car, on your run, or in the middle of your workday. I'm joined today by Dr. Gary Anderson, the Hesburgh Professor of Catholic Thought at the University of Notre Dame. His specialization is the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and in today's conversation, we tackle the Book of Tobit as a story of pilgrimage and life in Via. Well, good morning, Gary. Good morning to you, Joan. How are you today? Uh, it's a great morning. Uh, weather's good. I'm happy. Yeah, it's a, it's always good when we have good weather in South Bend. You know, like it may be few and far between, but when it's nice, it's nice, right? Uh, the summers are great. So, I regret that the students yeah. don't get to enjoy this. They, <laughs> yes. they spend most of their academic year and when South Bend's the worst. Yeah. When graduation weekend is always gorgeous and then they go on their way, right? <laughs> that's, you got, that's exactly right. <laughs> so we're talking about South Bend because uh, Dr. Anderson teaches at the University of Notre Dame. Um, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? So I, uh, my, my area of academic specialization is the Bible, specifically the Old Testament. Um, I studied, received my PhD at uh, Harvard University, and I've been very fortunate in teaching at very good institutions. Mm. I started out at the University of Virginia mm. and then moved back uh, to Harvard where I was. Uh, but then happily in 2003, I think it was, I was you know, given a job at Notre Dame and um, took that in a heartbeat and have been here for almost 20 years now, or actually 20, uh, a little over 20 years, and it's been fantastic. I love teaching here. Yeah. I would imagine that the students at Notre Dame, well, we do have a very diverse um, student body, and not everyone's Catholic, obviously. Um, is it different teaching the Old Testament at um, a uni at the University of Virginia versus Notre Dame. Like, how is that compared in your mind? It is, but maybe for reasons that might surprise some mm -hmm. listeners, I think, and surprised me as well. Uh, when I arrived here, um, I immediately began teaching our required uh, theology course mm -hmm. for first-year students, which I love doing. I've taught it uh, the entire time I've been here. Uh, but uh, I had taught nearly 20 years before I arrived at Notre Dame, but never took a course that wasn't an elective for the student mm. in question. So uh, whenever I walked in the classroom, I knew all the students in there had chosen to be there. Yeah. Uh, but it was a little bit of a surprise to walk into a classroom where almost no one chose to be I there. See that. And some would have rather been in a, a different class if they could have uh, chosen freely. So. Initially, I had to kind of adjust my teaching mm. style to uh, that audience, but over my time at Notre Dame, I've come to really love that. It's a challenge, and uh, my goal always every semester is to have, I, I of course, can never achieve 100% unanimity, but to get as many students mm. as possible on board with the notion that this is a course they should have chosen, ah, uh, could it. they have had that opportunity. Um, but I would say that was a big mental adjustment yeah, to walk into a that. room of suspicious students. Yes. Yeah. And that's exactly probably the opposite of what one would expect that answer to be, right? Like, oh, I teach at Notre Dame. And so all the Catholics know the Old <laughs> Testament. Yeah, right. Right. And so it's, um, it's a, that was almost the flip, right? That you're coming in here and you're almost having to prove your course in a sense. Yeah, very much a flip. And of course you have, you know, resistance from a number of different angles. I mm -hmm. mean, some students were very good, uh, and observant Catholics, but but, you know, felt that they had taken theology from kindergarten mm. through high school and they were ready to move on. I mean, I can understand that. But then other students, you know, were in their period of rebellion against yeah. parents, family, and religion. And so uh, from day one, they were, you know, dead set against anything, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a variety. But then, you know, there are always students, of course, who are eager uh, for good theological preparation as well. I mean, that goes without saying, but um, that's definitely not, you know, the only attitude you find when you sure. enter into a classroom here. Sure. Um, that first attitude of like, well, I took this in high school or, you know, I went to Catholic high school and so now I'm done. I, I worked at a diocese for many years and with adult formation, we always came across that, right? Like I don't, well, I went to Catholic school. I know everything. And I'm like, no accountant would say that. No doctor would say that, right? Like I took math in high school. I know everything, right? That this ongoing, um, 
idea of learning in our faith for some reason gets lost sometimes with Catholics. Like I don't need to look at religion. I don't need, because I took it once. Right. I think that's true. I think, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on this, but my sense is that, um, when you take theology in high school, it's definitely not at the intellectual level mm -hmm. of your other courses. Mm. And uh, so students, I think, you know, are generally pleasantly surprised to see when they come to a theology course at Notre Dame that the faculty, you know, have the same kind of credentials uh, that all the other faculty yeah. at the university do and that the approach to the material is intellectually serious and rigorous. Yes. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it went over a lot of students on that because, um, uh, if theology is just piety, I mean, that's mm -hmm. fine if you believe, but uh, even people who believe, I think, want uh, a deeper kind of root structure yes. uh, to what they believe. And I think that's the advantage of a well-taught academic theology course is that you can see there are, you know, very clear and uh, reasons uh, that yeah. one can articulate for why one would remain uh, in the Catholic Church. Well, that's putting it negatively, of course, but how, why one uh, could thrive within the Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we don't raise our theology courses to the same level of our other academics, we send out this message that, you know, it's just for nice little old ladies to pray the rosary at mass. And there we lose the Augustans and the Thomas Aquinas and the great, like we have the great Western um, intellectual tradition, but how often we fail to kind of pass that on to our kids. So like your high school may have a great biology program, but no, right. you know, theology program. So yeah, there's no could. AP class in theology. So, yes. And that's a that shame. <laughs> it is a, when you think about it, it is a shame. There, yeah. could be, there definitely could be AP theology. You could read the Summa. Yes. That yes. Would, that would give That'd students incredible. a real, you know, run for their money. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, and this does actually, I think, connect to this whole theme of this podcast in VIA, that we are all on this journey. We are all on this pilgrimage of life and the intellectual, I think, um, the intellectual search is part of that, that, you know, you are a different person in college than you were in high school and you'll be a different person later, the same person, of course, but that growth in our spiritual mm -hmm. life, in our intellectual life, that life is a journey and it's not stagnant. And the spiritual life, the intellectual life is part of that journey. Um, I was excited. Um, I asked Dr. Anderson, you know, would he like to talk about, you know, pilgrimage in the old Testament or what, what connected to the old Testament would he like to talk about? And he, specifically talked about the idea of in via, um, about being on the way on this journey and connected it to the book of Tobit. So that's going to be our topic today is the book of Tobit. I was thrilled because I love Tobit. I think it's a very accessible book because it's so short and it's a great story. So I've heard through the grapevine that you really love the book of Tobit. I told someone we're going to talk about Tobit. And they said, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> he loves Tobit. What drew you really to love the book of Tobit in all your old Testament studies? That's a great question. I don't know if I can answer mm. that because um, it certainly was an affection that came upon me late, but I had, I'd say, multiple points of origin. But if I, I tried to guess, and this at this point would be a guess, it was when I wrote my book on the subject of charity, mm. uh, I turned to Tobit because Tobit, of course, distinguishes himself through the what we Catholics would call the works of corporal mercy, yeah. burying the dead, feeding the hungry, you know, giving water to the thirsty, basically the virtues you see in Matthew 25, uh, you know, the criteria for, that will be used at the final judgment for, for all of us, which yeah. is basically concern for the poor. Um, and I think many Christians think that that, you know, is the kind of distinctive or unique teaching of Jesus, which at one level it is, but at another level, everything, you know, Jesus has to say there in Matthew 25 and actually about charity throughout the New Testament has already been anticipated uh, in the old and in particular mm -hmm. in the book of Tobit. So um, uh, I'd say that's really what, you know, drew me to the book. Also, it has a uh, a kind of um, very much, you might want to say, a Jobin a atmosphere. Mm. It's like the book of Job. In other words, uh, Tobit is uh, a man of uh, extraordinary piety, but he's punished for his piety. Uh, punish might not be the right word, but he's tried, let's yeah. say, for his piety. Struck yeah. blind, uh, loses all of his money, um, looks like he's going to uh, die without grandchildren. Everything looks very grim. Um, but then in the end, of course, it all turns around as it yeah. does for Job. 
Uh, but um, it's important to realize that the heart of the book or the center of the book, it certainly doesn't look like it will all turn yeah. around for Tobit. And uh, he's resigned himself to a tragic early death and um, sets in motion what he believes is uh, the, you know, the last you know, trip of his son and will end his life as well. But uh, happily for Tobit, it doesn't turn out that way. Yes. And I, I think some of our listeners may be not familiar with the book. It's kind of a unique book where it's not in the historical, you know, you don't find it as part of like the Exodus Genesis story, right? He's not a prophet. Um, you know, like you said, it kind of fits with Job, I think, and, and Judith and the, you know, but many of our listeners might not be familiar with the story because it isn't found um, in other, in Protestant Bibles. Um, can you give us like a crash a little crash course on the story. Um, so for people who might not know the story, you've already begun, but. So Tobit, I mean, it, formally, it's very similar, I would say, to the book of Daniel mm. in the sense that both of those books, their literary setting is roughly the third century, you know, B.C., about a couple of hundred years before the birth of Christ. But their literary setting is far earlier. Uh, Tobit is set in the period, the eighth century BCE, the period uh, in which uh, the northern kingdom of Israel will be is overrun by the Assyrians, and all of the northerners then are sent into exile. Uh, Daniel picks up basically the same theme, but a, a couple of hundred years later, uh, when uh, the Babylonians invade and then take all of the Israelites who live in the south, we know as Judeans, and exiles them to Babylon. So both books are exploring the notion of exile and hope for return. That really links to your in via theme mm -hmm. uh, because they both situate themselves uh, within the history of the people of Israel in which they're exiled from their land, uh, but yearning for return and restoration. Um, and uh, that's very much uh, the background of Tobit. So uh, Tobit takes that theme of exile and hoped for return from the vantage point of the Assyrian exile in the 8th century. Uh, and Daniel takes that uh, theme of exile and hoped for return uh, in the um, period of the Babylonian conquest. Yeah. I love this idea of that because Tobit is a book of charity, right? We see those acts of charity and, and Raphael says like, go and give alms, right? This idea of charity, even in an exile, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we can get like down about like, oh, well, the culture's not Catholic. And so I'm just going to go like, woe is me. Like, no, look, like Tobit did what he was supposed to do even surrounded by suffering, right? Even when he continues to suffer, this idea that charity never stops. Like we're called to love everyone. We're called to do charity, even in exile. Um, and to no, like place a, that in that context. That's exactly right. I think one of the key themes in the book of Tobit is the way in which uh, the charitable impulse replaces, uh, replaces perhaps not the exact exactly correct word, uh, parallels, we might want to say, the obligation to bring sacrifices to the temple. Mm. Uh, so charity develops this strong, you know, what I call sacramental sense. Uh, it is definitely about, you know, making a better world, correcting injustices for the poor, etc. That's all there. Uh, but it's more than that. It's really about the worship of God. Um, and that also overlaps with what happens within early Christianity as well. I mean, one of my favorite quotes of um, uh, St. John Chrysostom is uh, after, you know, celebrating the Mass, he tells his congregants to go out into the streets of Antioch and meet the many living altars there. Mm. That means all the poor people in the street. They're all ways of encountering Christ. So that's an important thing to realize that charity is uh, more than, you know, uh, a social justice movement. And I have nothing against social justice. It is that. Yeah. Uh, but it's a social justice movement grounded in a kind of uh, a very uh, unique form of Christology. But that's also anticipated in Tobit, not the Christological element, but the notion that one's obligation to the poor is inseparable from one's obligation to God. Mm. And you can see that in the very first book of to for first chapter, I'm sorry, of of Tobit, in which uh, his virtues are initially displayed in the extraordinary mm -hmm. fidelity he has to the temple in Jerusalem. 
uh, but then of course that temple is going to be destroyed uh, and so the author immediately picks up with Tobit now in exile uh, you know acting charitably uh, towards those around him and that parallelism is uh, you know a very pointed and intentional aspect of the book wow. he can no longer worship at the temple of course in Assyria but he can do the next best thing uh, which is to serve God uh, wow. through his acts of mercy to the poor wow and I'm, it makes me think about how um, the temple obviously was central to the Jews. It gave them their identity in a lot of ways, right? Their identity came from the Sabbath and from temple worship. And when that's taken away, and we see this, especially after the, the temple destruction in 70 B AD, mm -hmm. they have to figure out what is a Jew without a temple, right? right. Um, but then it reminds me that um, that we are known by as Christians by our love, that like what should give us our identity? Sure, the Eucharist and the sacrifice of the mass, but 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 it's very clearly in the New Testament, they will know you're my disciples because you love one another. And so that charity being that defining factor for us of love of neighbor, not just for the sake of loving neighbor, but through then loving the Lord. Yeah, there I think uh, the document I love to use in teaching that brings out you know, the insight you wonderfully brought up is uh, Deus Caritas mm. Est of Benedict XVI, God is Love, yeah. uh, where he makes it quite clear that, you know, a Eucharist that doesn't, you know, open up into service of the poor is a, uh, I can't remember his word, not improper, but certainly a fractured or partial celebration of the sacrament. Uh, and he has a great uh, quote, you know, in that same section, I believe it's paragraphs 13 to 18, somewhere in that range, where he says that Mother Teresa's experience of the Eucharist was enriched by her service to the poor and her mm -hmm. service to the poor correlatively enriched mm -hmm. her celebration of the Eucharist. In other words, uh, these kind of vectors go both ways. And um, that's an important thing to bear in mind, because what is the Eucharist? It's Christ offering his life uh, to us. Uh, and what is charity? Charity is offering, you know, what we value, our material possessions, but giving them to others. So, I mean, in the Christian understanding, the uh, charitable act is deeply, you know, cruciform in that sense. Yeah, yeah. I, we just came off, um, off of the Eucharistic <coughs> Congress in D.C., and one of the talks talked about um, the two lungs of, like, breathing in of worship of the Lord and then breathing out service to the poor. Mm -hmm. And if you only have one, if you, don't, if you only breathe in, you're going to die. If you only breathe out, you're mm -hmm. going to die. And so that this, this right. parallel, I thought that was a beautiful image of this, this parallel, like, um, of loving the Lord through the neighbor. And it's not just either or, but it has to be both and. Yeah, I think um, that's 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 yeah. at the heart of what Deus Caritas yeah. Est uh, wishes to say. And I yeah. think that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, looking back at Tobit, um, we actually have a journey, uh, an actual kind of pilgrimage that Tobit's son takes um, with Archangel Raphael. Um, it's where we find the Archangel uh, Raphael in scripture in the book of Tobit. Um, so you could talk, could you talk a little bit about that next part of the story? So there's actually, <clears throat> if we're thinking about pilgrimage in Tobit, there's, I think, two journeys we would want to, to frame. So that's one, I'll get to that in a second. But the chap book opens up, as I mentioned, with uh, Tobit's, uh, the, you know, reciting of Tobit's fulfillment of the obligation to go and pilgrimage three times a year to Jerusalem. Mm, yes. And that's the primary pilgrimage, you know, theme within the Old Testament is uh, the term in Hebrew is uh, Allah or Aliyah is the noun, verbal noun, to go up, uh, to go up to the city of Jerusalem to worship God at his holy mountain. And there are three occasions during the year in which uh, the religious Israelite or now the religious Jew would be obligated to do such Passover, uh, Pentecost and the Feast of Booths uh, in the fall. And we read in chapter one that Tobit, you know, is exemplary among his peers as the only one uh, in northern Israel who continues to do this wow. after the northern kingdom separates from the south and establishes alternative worship sites. But Tobit is mm. portrayed as a man of, you know, super erogatory piety uh, because of his continuation wow. to follow the uh, injunctions of uh, the book of Deuteronomy. But more than that, it's also quite significant that Tobit hails from the tribe of Naphtali. Because if you look at a map, if you go to the back of your Bibles where you have maps, you'll notice that Naphtali is in the far north, 
which means his journey is of uh, extra, you know, a considerable distance. I mean, yeah. if he was located, for example, in the tribe of Benjamin, which is right next door to Jerusalem, he basically fall out of bed and he's there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's not how the book sets wow. up the story. Tobit is from the far north. So this journey, this pilgrimage that he makes that uh, exemplifies his virtuosity uh, is uh, something that comes at mm. great cost. Uh, to his person. Now, uh, the book is framed by that story of his going up to Jerusalem, but the book ends in part in chapter 13 with the famous uh, song of thanksgiving of Tobit, uh, in which um, he not only thanks God for uh, restoring him from death to life, uh, from being blind to having sight, from, you know, only one child to now a married child mm -hmm. with many grandchildren. All of these are exempl exemplary in the Old Testament of going from death to life. We can see that in the New Testament too. The prodigal story of the prodigal mm. son uh, um, talks about the son going from "I was dead, but now I'm alive," or "You were dead." I can't remember if the father might yeah. say that, but that's very much the movement in Tobit. But Tobit uses that occasion not simply to celebrate what God did for him, but to use, as it were, that action of God on his behalf as leverage for the people Israel. So mm. his concerns aren't just about himself or his immediate mm. family, but his entire people. And he expresses that with the hope that Jerusalem will be rebuilt and that Jerusalem will reflect uh, the promises made to this city in the second half of the prophet Isaiah. So if you look at Tobit 13, you'll wow. see that he's channeling uh, some of the more extraordinary promises made to Jerusalem in the prophet Isaiah. But all of that's very important because we have to remember that Tobit, as I mentioned, is written in the second century when actually the temple is rebuilt. Mm. Uh, but what's very important for Judaism in this period is though they celebrate that temple that's within Jerusalem, they realize because of the nature of biblical promises that God has promised mm. an even bigger and better temple. Mm. So uh, even though they're making pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the time in which the book of Tobit is written, they're still expecting more. Uh, so they are still in via, right? Yeah. They haven't arrived. That's yeah. a very important feature of the book. It's a kind of uh, already in part, yes, the second temple has been built, but not yet. The wow. full you know, expectation of what God intends to bring about is still awaited. So this theme of Jerusalem and uh, the notion of being in via and uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem all of which, of course, is in the background in the book of Revelation and Christian eschatology as well, uh, is a deep part uh, of the book. So that's, that's the wow. frame. So that's a very important element of travel, and we might want to say pilgrimage uh, yeah. within the book of Tobit. But then <clears throat> really the heart of the book is what you mentioned in terms of the plot line of Tobit's own life, which is sending his uh, son, Tobiah's son, uh, what, what appears to be, at least in the frame of the book, a uh, dangerous journey mm -hmm. uh, to recover uh, funds that uh, Tobit has left on deposit. Uh, the book never says why um, Tobias has to go and do this. In fact, uh, Tobit's wife uh, is quite angry at uh, <laughs> sending the son on this perilous she's journey. She's kind of an angry woman in this book, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, a little she, bit? <laughs> I think she's justified, though. I mean, uh, I think most of us would sympathize with that. They only have one son left. Why risk everything on a trip that seems so dangerous? Of course, uh, he's being accompanied, as you mentioned, by the archangel Raphael, but they don't know that. Yeah. Uh, he's just a, you know, a guy, yeah. an ordinary citizen. <laughs> so uh, why entrust mm. your uh, only remaining son to a stranger. Um, but uh, that's, of course, a risk uh, that Tobit assumes that pays off mm -hmm. spectacularly uh, in ways they could never have foreseen. They're imagining, <clears throat> or Tobit's imagining he's going to retrieve the money he left on deposit, but he finds a far more important goal yes. uh, or a aim as he embarks on this journey when uh, he meets his future wife. Yeah. Uh, who also is suffering <clears throat> for her piety as well. Uh, yeah. All of her husbands uh, are put to death <clears throat> when they enter the uh, wedding canopy. So she seems to be damaged goods. Yeah. I think that's an important part of the story mm. as well, because when Tobias decides to go through with that marriage, 
uh, and consummate the marriage, of course, on his wedding night, uh, he has to know full well that this night hasn't ended well yes. for all yes. the previous suitors. So it's a risk on his behalf. And in fact, one of the kind of comic uh, moments in the book is uh, his father-in-law is out digging a grave. That's my favorite part, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's an incredible <laughs> moment. I mean, he's just convinced this is the end. Yeah. Uh, but um, it doesn't prove to be the yes. end. They survive their wedding night. And then very importantly for the book, um, the, he, you know, not only survives, they marry and they eventually have many children. So, yeah. uh, that can allow the book to end in what I like to call the kind of old Testament, you know, perspective on resurrection or beatific mm. vision, how to, uh, charmed or beatified characters end their life in the Bible. They usually end their life with, uh, their children, grandchildren, and sometimes even great grandchildren gathered around them. Uh, that was true for Jacob, Abraham in the book of Genesis. It's true for Job, mm -hmm. very important element of the book of Job that uh, when he dies, all of his family is around him. Uh, and the same thing then, of course, happens for Tobit. Uh, that really is the sign that he, you know, lived a graced uh, life. <clears throat> and, uh, but, you know, that didn't seem to be in the cards in chapter four. And it was that risky journey uh, yeah. that his son embarks on that made all of that possible. Yeah. There's a there's a passage that I love, a chapter um, where Tobit's praying and we have this temptation to even end his life. Like he asks the Lord, like, take me. Right. Like, why am I? And then we have this parallel image with um, with with Sarah. Is it Sarah? Yes. Yeah. Sarah praying the same thing because she's been insulted by her maid. You know, um, <clears throat> she's not been successful. All her husbands have died and on the wedding night, very dramatically. And um, and that that it, like the Lord hears their prayer at the same time, right? And this idea that um, they're in a sense the world would look at them as damaged goods, like you said, right? Like right. he's a blind old man that you know what has he what what reward has his piety gotten him but suffering right and she uh, apparently is faithful but she's been cursed by this demon right that has killed her husbands and so this this um willingness just to cry out to the lord to put ourselves in his hands and the lord rewards that prayer um greatly like more than they could probably ever imagine and it just gives me so much hope that we are all in the middle of our stories right mm -hmm. we're in the middle of the story we're not at the end of the story and to never give up that prayer and to never give up on others that never judge those damaged goods because the lord is still working in their lives no that's very true and i think i mean i mentioned the jobin element i think it's a key theme in the book yeah. of tobit and we um you know uh one of the ways in which we can measure uh, Tobit's virtue is the, by the fact that he retains his faithfulness to God and to the moral life, the moral life structured by charity, even though it, not only is it not rewarded, but, you know, it seems to be from all external circumstance punished. So yeah. it makes, you know, his virtuosity you know, all the more stellar and really uh, supernatural. You know, Augustine, yeah. uh, one of my favorite lines from Augustine on the book of Tobit is that, you know, he said that Tobit had to see the world through a supernatural light. Mm. You know, even though he was blind, mm. um, he clearly saw or uh, retained a notion of God's goodness yeah. uh, through it all, which is, you know, yes, I think it's one of the more spectacular features of the book. Yeah, that faithfulness. <laughs> Um, and it is a book of great adventure, right? I mean, it, it seems to be dangerous. They get attacked by a large fish. I mean, yes. there's this like crazy scene where this fish, I think the translation varies in what exactly came out of the water. Um, but then um, they kill it and that ends up being a source of healing for Tobit's blindness, which is, it's just, there's all these fantastic elements in the story. Yeah, that like kind of life-threatening moment. And you're right. One of the things that's actually a challenge for Tobit is that the text is very, unstable. So uh, there's a couple of Greek translations, for example, that scholars, you know, refer to <clears throat> when they're trying to reconstruct the, the text of Tobit. And then you have several, you know, uh, Latin versions and versions in other languages as well. We have uh, at Qumran, we have probably, you know, remnants of the Aramaic original, but they're only remnants. They're kind of scattered, you know, pieces. So uh, the story sometimes is difficult to reconstruct. I think of it as analogous to uh, Da Vinci's painting, uh, The Last Supper, which uh, was marred by, uh, they uh, eventually built a door that wiped mm. out Christ's feet, for example. So people, scholars that work on that painting have to rely to a degree on early drawings. 
mm-hmm. of uh, you know other artists who love the painting because those are our records wow. of how it might have yeah. really looked. And in a sense with Tobit, it's the same thing. We have to, we have all of these different versions. We have to take guesses as to what the original might have uh, looked like. I mean, I shouldn't overstate the matter. I mean, ninety uh, percent of the plot line is quite clear, but there are many moments like the encounter with the fish, of course, that are uh, somewhat you know more uh, ambiguous. But the encounter with the fish is extraordinary because it, it actually provides the means of solving the two problems of the book, uh, uh, Sarah's, you know, um, Mm -hmm. ability to marry and uh, mother children, but also uh, the healing of uh, Tobit's blindness. Mm -hmm. And the fish is the kind of key ingredient for both of those uh, problems. Can we see a spiritual meaning behind that of this, like, I mean, is it just this random thing that this fish attacks them and then the liver is used to, to, you know, or can we, can we look into it as a spiritual, like once he was willing to face death, then I don't know. I, I, I'm making this up as I go along right now, but I just think it's, is it just this random occurrence or is there something deeper there where there's this encounter with death that he, um, Raphael helps him overcome, and then out of that comes healing, out of that comes resurrection for both involved. That's an interesting suggestion. I, I have to say I haven't thought about it, but I think the book is uh, very much onto the theme that what looks like uh, a death-dealing peril yeah. uh, will often turn into a life-giving you know, opportunity. Yeah. I think certainly the whole travel story of Tobias is exactly that. Mm -hmm. Uh, The risk that Tobit is willing to take to send his son on this journey that could be the end of him ends up being not only not the end of him, but actually the restoration of the Mm -hmm. entire family. Uh, So that this, you know, uh, flirtation, we might want to say, uh, with death becomes the occasion of a life-giving moment. And in that sense, the book, I think, is also deeply uh, Christological, or we might want to say cruciform and character, mm-hmm. where uh, the cross becomes not the end of the of a tragic life, but actually the occasion of the celebration of uh, a divine reward yeah. uh, for a life well lived, yeah. and um, that's very much part of Tobit as yeah. well. I was going to ask: Do any of the church fathers or any biblical commentators see this as a Christological that the father sends the son out on mission? Right, the father sends his only son out. Um, and then the, the son's, you know, this great adventure of the son, almost Mm -hmm. like the incarnation then leads to that restoration. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I've written on that subject, but I'm not a church father, so that doesn't (laughs) count. So, uh, honestly, I've not, you know, I've not checked that out. Perhaps I should have. I mean, we don't have a lot of commentary on the book among the church fathers. Um, we have, um, uh, no, who who Ambrose I think has a short commentary which I've looked at but can't haven't carefully yeah. studied, and then uh, Cyprian also comments on the book but I don't remember that he highlights that I think Cyprian's interest is more uh, on Tobit as a man of charity, mm-hmm. um, and you know the the parallels of Tobit to. Uh, the New Testament virtues <clears throat> were obvious to all of these writers, yeah. and that's <clears throat> typically where they went. The focus, yeah. <clears throat> um, well, this is this has been beautiful, and I think it's given us a lot of um, of fruit for our own prayer as we're looking at our own lives in Via, as we're looking at our own pilgrimage of life. Um, you know, all these themes of of a life of charity, a life in exile. Um, you know, resurrection out of death. Um, this idea of hope. I think it it really. Um, more than I was even expecting before we started this conversation. I think it speaks to us as Christians in Via on the way. Um, I have one question that I don't know whether it has an answer to, Mm. but do you have any insight as to the dog? Uh, No, everyone asks about the dog, of course. It's quite (laughs) surprising. It's an interesting little detail. It is. It appears twice, you know, and uh, when people, you know, draw, we have, you know, of course, artistic renderings, Rembrandt and the et cetera, they'll often show the the little doggy, as I say, uh, running along with Tobias. But it is quite surprising because dogs don't have that kind of cachet generally uh, in the Bible. If anything, they're, you know, animals of, you know, less, I don't want to say disreputable, but certainly not 
<clears throat> not charming in the way we imagine yeah. them. But it is a very charming animal in the Book of Tobit, yeah. and I have no wisdom on that. Yeah, I apologize. No, I, I think it's something we'll just wait in heaven and ask, you know, yeah. ask well, Tobit himself. Like, because um, for those of you who haven't read Tobit, there it's very clearly mentioned, like, and the dog went with them. And, the, you know, pe dogs as pets just wasn't part, doesn't right. seem to be part of Jewish culture. And no, so you're right. who is this little dog? And um, I mean, I think now we can look at Fido as a, some, you know, the dog is a symbol of fidelity. But yep. that wouldn't have been that would be reading something now back into I think so. into that. So, I think we want to resist that. Right. But on the other hand, I have no good answers. Yeah, so um, I guess any, any answer we suggest is a possibility. Yeah, I love it. Um, is there anything else you would like to um, to note about this this beautiful book, this rich book as we we wrap up any um, final thoughts or um, any last last points? So, I mean, I think one of the more profound themes of the book and, and you alluded to it already is Tobit's prayer prayer in chapter three. I've always viewed this also as deeply Christological mm. because what's surprising mm. about it is it's a prayer of confession of sin. Um, but we know from the beginning of the book of Tobit that Tobit is, at least with respect to what brought on the exile of the Northern Kingdom, completely innocent of those mm. sins. So, uh, and the first chapter of the book is, you know, set out really to demonstrate his innocence, but more than innocence, his, I would call his super erogatory faith. That is a faith yeah. that goes beyond uh, any kind of, you know, normal measurement uh, in the way in which uh, descending from the tribe of Naphtali, uh, he engages faithfully in the three pilgrimage festivals. And the reason for exiling the Northern Kingdom is because they specifically didn't do that. Yeah. So chapter three is a big shocker when we see Tobit, you know, wow. confess that sin. Um, but for me, this is very similar to Jesus agreeing to participate in John's baptism. Uh, mm. My colleague uh, now passed away, sadly, John Meyer and his, you know, famous set of books on the historical Jesus, uh, you know, commented at great length on, you know, Jesus' agreement to undergo John's baptism, which was utilized by some scholars in a kind of anti-Christian sense. Well, the, this is a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. Jesus willingly participates, ergo, he must mm. have understood himself as a sinner, to which John Meyer said, well, I mean, in a sense, that's a kind of, you know, logical syllogism that can't be, you know, uh, uh, broken. But uh, what's wrong with it is the presumption that confession of sin in this period was the confession of individual uh, mm -hmm. and individual sins, whereas uh, we know that confession of sin, as imagined by the John the Baptist, is a confession of corporate sin. Mm -hmm of, uh, you know, Israel's uh, disobedience that led to her exile. That's, yeah. and so when Jesus, you know, participates within that uh, uh, confession of sin, what he's essentially doing, my colleague John Meyer argued, is demonstrating his fidelity and solidarity with his people, right? That, yeah. you know, he doesn't see himself as somehow holier than thou yeah. and point his finger and say, well, you're suffering because you did this, but, you know, I didn't do that, uh, so I don't suffer. No, that's that, but that's not Jesus' person. Yeah. Jesus engages in radical solidarity with his people of Israel uh, and so can engage in this confession of sin, not because he himself is a sinner, but because he loves his people. Mm. And I think that's exactly how we should read that prayer of Tobit in chapter three. Um, not that he's the second person of the Trinity and innocent <laughs> in the way Jesus is. I don't, don't want to overstate the matter. Uh, but uh, his confession of sin, which initially appears somewhat you know, unusual given yeah. his innocence, I think is calculated to make the point that Tobit is a person who um, is never just kind of uh, pointing his finger at his people and touting his own piety over against their impiety, but rather uh, implicates himself yeah. uh, in the history, the tragic history of his people and refuses to be separated from them. And that will set up then his prayer of thanksgiving, as I mentioned in chapter 13, where he'll have the same attitude towards his salvation. It's not for him, mm. but the salvation is meant to be uh, a spur uh, yeah. to the people's salvation, which is exactly what happens at Christ's resurrection. It's not about just him being raised, yeah. but it's all of us being raised with him. 
So I think uh, I love that part of the book of Tobit, yeah. and I think it, you know, uh, comes at that Christological theme and a distinctively, we might want to say, Old Testament, from a distinctively Old Testament vantage point. Yeah. We've lost, I, I think, and maybe it's just the circles I run in, but I think we've lost a lot of that idea of corporate, like of making atonement even for sins that might not be ours, but just recognizing that we are all to blame. I feel like, and maybe it's the individual um that triumph of the individual that we find in America that, mm -hmm. but it's, it seems like a lot of times it's us pointing fingers at those people over there, or they've done something <laughs> wrong rather than taking on that, that all of us are to blame. Right. Then, right. and, and, and how, how do we then make atonement for that? How do we sacrifice for that? How do we do works of charity for that? Um, I feel like we've lost that corporate sense of we are all to blame for the situation we're in. Um, it's not that person over there. Um, would you I think agree? That's, no, I think that's exactly right. I guess if I was to quote, you know, Benedict again in, in his uh, encyclical Space Salvi, Saved by Hope, mm -hmm. he addresses specifically that notion of uh, thinking of salvation yeah. in an overly individualistic yeah. uh, frame of mind that uh, when we conceive of salvation within uh, the Christian church, our thoughts should definitely, you know, tend towards the corporate element. Yeah. And it's certainly one of the reasons that informs the piety of purgatory, of praying for family members, mm -hmm. et cetera, and asking family members to pray for us because our salvation is never simply that of an autonomous individual, yeah. uh, but an individual linked uh, to all those, you know, around us. And, um, yeah, uh, de Lubach, I know uh, Ratzinger, the Pope Benedict, also cites on this score. There are, I think, rich, you know, Catholic resources for recovering this notion of <clears throat> sin is corporate and salvation is corporate. I mean, it's not to dismiss the individual part sure, sure. <clears throat> for, for certain, but yeah. I think the individual part has been so overly you know, uh, emphasize yeah. that recovery of the corporate element is, you know, important, you know, uh, hope for the church. Yeah. Yeah. We are the body of Christ and we are many members, but we are one. Right. Um, I think of, um, you know, John Paul II in the year 2000 <coughs> asking forgiveness for the sins of the church. And he went back and he asked for the forgiveness, you know, forgiveness of sins he personally hadn't committed. Right. right. But as Peter, he's asking for this kind of corporate um, forgiveness from the Lord and from those we had hurt. And so to recover that. Um, and it reminds me of pilgrimage, that we are not on pilgrimage alone. Um, even those people who may like strike out on the Camino all by themselves, they, they quickly find companions. Um, and that's the pilgrimage of life too. We don't have to do this alone. That's the beauty of the church, that we are on this in via. It's not an individual um, solo in via, but that we are True. in this together. And a lot together. of people who go on pilgrimage also will contact their friends in advance and ask them for prayer, prayer requests. Absolutely. So yes. that on via, they can... Yes. You know, again, kind of like Tobit, leverage their own piety here to the yeah. benefit of those beyond themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I know at, at Versa, we always pray for our pilgrims um, by name, actually, before they go, knowing um, and after knowing that that's the best way we can accompany someone is spiritually. So that's great. Well, thank you very much, Gary. I appreciate the time. I appreciate the conversation about Tobit. And um, listeners, thanks for listening. And I encourage you to share this episode maybe with someone who is in via, as we all are, but also someone who might be interested in the Old Testament, interested in the book of Tobit, maybe has never read the book of Tobit. Um, but share this episode, follow us, and tune in next time. God bless.